All right, hello everyone, how's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly, a JavaScript news podcast, episode 24 for the 18th of August. And uh, yeah, today we're gonna talk about some, eh, a bit of JavaScript news, I guess, some releases, some libraries and demos, and a bit of a silly stuff. As you know, as it, as it was for the past few episodes, it is August, uh, season of vacations essentially, and uh, we don't really have that much things going on, but there are some news. So let's get started and let's see what do we have this week around, shall we? First thing we got is the variable scope in modern JavaScript, a pretty extensive article that explains what the scope is and um, how exactly the global scope is different from the local scope and from the block scope, which was introduced with the lat variable. So if you are still um, unsure about the scope, if you are still not completely understand the concept of the scope, which I think it took me a more than a couple of years to completely get a grasp on it. Um, I would highly recommend reading this article to uh, basically understand what is going on because I think this is one of the most important uh, concepts within the JavaScript because if you are not using it correctly, you will shoot yourself in the foot. So yes, quite good article, uh, recommended reads. Do, do have a look at it if you are still having problems with uh, scoping. All right, next article we got is Web Payments, Payments Request API, and Google Pay. Um, the article that outlines the difference between the three, for whatever reason people uh, get confused about it. If you didn't know, there is a Payment Request API that is common to the browsers. I believe it is already shipped in Google Chrome, so you actually will be able to um, do sort of payment requests using JavaScript. The Web Payments is the W3C working group that is behind the standard, and well, Google Pay is Google Pay. I, don't know if anyone actually needed any introductions to it, but apparently they do. So the article goes a bit in depth to explain what the hell are all those things are and how exactly you use them. And um, yes, you can use payment request API on the web with Google Pay or without Google Pay if you um, if you would like to, right? But uh, it is it is quite nice that basically once again the web platform is coming closer to the native uh, apps, especially on mobiles, right? Because this is going to be uh, quite a game changer, I think. So if you are interested in payment API and the whole like process and applications and usage uh, of it with Google Pay, then do have a look at this article. It does gives you a pretty good uh, understanding of the basics at least. All right, next thing we got is pseudo localization at Netflix. This is a really cool one, uh, probably one of my favorite ones. So uh, this is an article from the Netflix team, as you might imagine, and they talk about localization issues, right? So when you translate or localize the text, it's not always the same. In fact, it can be completely different. Like here's an example of the German UI. So in, in English, it will be don't miss out. And in German, it is uh, lassen Sie sich nichts entgehen, right? So it is twice longer probably and if you leave the same uh if you leave the same ui elements it will just truncate it so it will it will look bad basically right which means that you have not just localized things but you also have to account for those changes and localizations within the ui themselves so they, they came up with this solution that is called pseudo localization, which essentially uh, takes the original english string and screws it up completely using random characters and as well adding additional symbols to make it longer, right? So plus I think there was like a proposed um, padding basically and additional things that make it even longer so that, you know, it breaks more things essentially. So you account for uh, strings that are way longer than they are, which I think is a really cool approach. So there's a bit more um, interesting details in the article itself and uh, a bit more information uh, about how exactly this approach works. But if you are interested, if you're working on a localization of the apps, I think this is a really cool way of uh, making sure that, you know, different languages and different symbols actually fit and show properly. And uh, yes, I personally do like that. I don't know if there's actually any library for that. I don't, I haven't seen any links here, but it will be cool to have something like this. Um, you could basically plug and play for your own apps, you know. But yeah, okay, let's continue. The next article we got is learning web development in 2018. Basically, article overviewing what the hell are you, can you learn uh, with regards to web development in 2018 because there's so much to learn and the ecosystem is growing quickly. 
And uh, there are some claims that I'm not sure I agree with, like it's never been better, it's never going to get better. I, I agree that it's never been better for sure, but it's never going to get better, like come on. The JavaScript has been g developing with a light speed, uh, speed, which is a terrible way of putting it, but you get what I'm meaning. <laughs> I get what I mean. And um, I think it's, it's just going to get better like a lot. Um, or at least for the next couple of years, maybe even more, we're going to get a lot more new features that will be will make language a lot easier and nicer and better, right? So I don't think it's never going to get better. It's like maybe in the meaning that it's never going to get better. And oh, I guess, yeah. This is what the author meant primarily, right? So in, in this case, yes, but um, with regards to framework or like with regards to language itself, it is kind of, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so if you are just getting into learning web development, if you are struggling, if you are, if you need some pointers, so this is more of a very general article on with thoughts on how you should approach learning, how you should approach the concepts, how you should approach the, um, picking the technologies and so on and so forth. Uh, so if you're just getting started, it's a good one. If you are already learning, if you already know what you're doing, then you probably won't really find any uh, useful information in here. So yeah. Okay, next one we got is how to debug a Node.js in a Docker container. Um, the article starts with basically, why should I do this? Explaining that, okay, sometimes if you run the app locally, it will work fine. And then if you package it, it will break. While this is true, one of the great advantages of Node.js is that it works more or less ubiquitously on all, in all environments, right? So there are some minor changes, but 90% of them are related to the packages with na native parts. So like, you know, C++ libraries compiled to Node and so on and so forth. So unless you're using that and unless this is the problem. I don't think I've ever encountered a problem where I packaged the app into Note, into Docker container, and it just didn't work because it was in the Docker. So it always was those native libraries for me, I think. But um, nonetheless, if you are packaging and if you don't know what the problem is, um, well, there are caveman approach, as the authors say, you can just console log everything and you know see what the hell's going on, which is not very nice, right? On the other hand, you can use the inspector, which is way nicer. And but to do that, you need to actually expose the node app from the Docker container. So in this case, author for whatever reason uses Docker compose for one container, which I guess is fine, but uh, just sounds wasteful because like Docker compose does a bit uh, like a bunch of additional things in addition to just running the container, which I don't think you want to do most of the time, but you know, whatever, whatever works basically. So I think I would personally just run it from command line, but yeah, you just run it with uh, ports bounds. You would need port of your app, which is in this case in the demo 3000. And then you would need the port for debugging, which by default is uh, 9229. And then you would need to modify the command, which would be nodes uh, minus minus inspect break um, and bound it to 000 uh, IP address, which would expose it to the world, right? And then you can just use your external tools, whatever you use, Chrome Inspector, or um, I think uh, I think the um, the new NDB tool doesn't really can't really attach to already running things, so you have to actually run it. Um, run the command with it. So yeah, why not NDB exactly? That's the part on it. And uh, yeah, so basically, if you are having problems, or maybe just want to know how to handle those problems with dockerizing node apps and debugging them within the Docker container to figure out what's breaking, then this article can help you with that. All right, let's continue. Uh, the next thing we got is fairy tale about performance in web applications. Um, this is a terrifying story about uh, JavaScript blocking browser rendering for 30 seconds. This is something that actually can happen. I've, um, I think I've personally seen, well, some websites that do things like this and they, I, I, like I randomly stumble upon them when I search for news or whatever, because it seems to be relatively popular websites. And then, you know, you try to search something or use the like, controls on the website and every time you press a button and it filters a list, it just hangs. 
And you go like, how is this possible in 2018? Well, apparently it is not that hard to do. So this article goes in depth into the story about the uh, website that basically is uh, using quite a modern um, infrastructure. So it's React, React Redux, Reselect, Redux Saga, Router, and Mobix. So they, first of all, this is a bit weird. Yes, they combine Redux and Mobix, which is kind of strange, but you know, whatever. And on the other hand, you know, it's a modern setup. So all of those libraries are quite modern and they are really nice. And I don't think, I mean, I haven't used Mobex that much. So I, I definitely know that Redux doesn't really have any performance problems if you use it correctly. And the documentation is good enough to be able to, you know, easily do that basically. But I've heard good things about Mobex. So I think it's gonna, um, I, I ex she expected it to work just as good, right? But well, it turns out there are some uh, Mobex related problems. And if you're interested to know what the hell has happened here and why was there a 25, 30 seconds wait time on load before the browser actually would start rendering and how the author actually tackled it and solved it and made it uh, non-blocking, uh, additionally implementing his own um, custom tool for measuring performance then do have a look at this article it is really cool and very detailed and explains basically everything that's happened and how uh, the author solved that so it's a really good one and uh, yes be careful with adding libraries to your project and using them without actually investigating the performance especially if your website is at least somewhat popular so all right the next article we got is a sync generators as an alternative to state management this is a really nice one. So the idea is that you don't really need any state management libraries, which is, I mean, <laughs> something we've heard more than once, I think. But um, in this case, the proposal is to use the async generators, right, as the state management uh, thing. So um, if you are watching this on stream, or if you're watching this on YouTube, you can have a look at the screen right now, there is a bit of code that basically uh, is a sync generator that is, uh, in this case, they uh, give the vanilla JS Redux example, which is, you know, the counter state, and then you take the uh, action and depending on action, you usually um, uh, either increment the state or decrement the state, right? So in this case, you have the function, which is the uh, sync generator function, uh, which has the uh, inner variable state, which is zero, right? So this is our counter. And the first thing it yields, which is the return from the generator is the value and state. So in this case, I think it doesn't even have to be a sync generator because we don't really do anything async here, but async generators are better because then you can use, uh, then you can have any async actions within there, right? So, uh, right, whenever um, the async, the generator action takes input, which could be, uh, which have type, right? So this is basically exactly the same switch as the Redux has. So you switch, you wait for the input, you uh, take this action and um, based on type, you do the switch, you either increment state, decrement state, and then yield another value, which is what the, again, generator uh, generators do, right? So um, that's basically all you have to do. So in addition, there's some minor how to say minor utilities that you have to use around it to uh, basically make it simpler to work with it. So you have the create store function, you have pipe function, and that's basically it. So that's all the store. I like the thing is that I, uh, first of all, I think this is a really cool application for uh, sync generators, because it basically allows you to do just about anything you want um, with essentially one function, right? The thing is that I don't know if it's going to be easier to use something like this than a Redux or a full fledged um, state management solution like unstated, for example, which is simple enough as it, as it is, right. But um, as a sort of exercise, and a, as an example of application of an async generators, this is really, really cool. And um, yeah, there's even talk about like how you can persist state how you can um, actually import values from other files. So lazy load components and things like this, like there is really, really neat um, background to this, basically, let's put it this way. So if you're interested, if that sounds interesting to have a look at the article, it is quite good. 
Okay, continuing, we got progressive enhancement with CSS grid. Yet another CSS grid article, but this time around it doesn't really talk uh, why CSS grid is awesome and uh, you know why you should switch to it immediately, but rather it talks about taking the code that you already have and instead of throwing out the old stuff and just using CSS grid, because like, for example, you might need to support the older browsers, right? It talks about using CSS grid in addition. So how to actually enhance the website with the CSS grid so that modern browsers show uh, basically use grid, right? And show you a better uh, layout and the older browsers just render whatever the hell you rendered before that which is a really great approach, something I really like. And uh, I think the best approach probably for the large applications. So there's a example with a content and a footer here that should be sticky when the content is not long enough and should be way below when the content is longer than it should be, right? So um, there's code included and some additional thoughts and tips for how to actually debug that. So if you're interested in enhancing your own website with CSS grid, do have a look. This is a really good article about that. All right, next thing we got is JavaScript engine fundamentals, optimizing prototypes. Another very low level, very awesome article from the V8 uh, team from specifically two authors, Benedict and Matthias. We already covered their previous article uh, that was on optimization pipelines. Uh, this one is actually on optimization of prototypes. And just as you would imagine, it like just look at the size of it. This is like, I don't know, 15 pages, probably, if not more 20 pages, it goes very in depth to show how exactly not just V8, but specifically the JavaScript engines. In this case, they also talk about spider monkey optimizes for object prototypes, what kind of how, how the you know, how the optimization pipelines work, how the for example, Turbofan and igniter uh, work in the V8, how the ion monkey works in the uh, spider monkey, which I think is really cool. Um, I have some really loud cars outside, I hope you can really hear them guys. All right. Um, yeah, but it is like it goes from the very sort of high level diagrams of explaining what exactly happens within the engine to very low level even assembly code that shows what exactly happens within the optimizations, right? And it talks about, okay, so you can actually optimize it at a very high level, but then that would require a lot of memory, right? And it is insanely uh, detailed, as you would imagine, as you would expect from them, I guess. Um, and there is a lot of really interesting things uh, about the object prototype optimization. So if you want to make your code more efficient, if you want to know how exactly the VA or I guess JavaScript engines optimize uh, for the object prototype performance, then this article is definitely highly recommended reading. There is also a um, YouTube video in the very beginning uh, available. So there was a GS Camp Barcelona uh, talk that is, I think, related to this. So basically, you can either read the article or just watch the video if you prefer. Right. Uh, the next article we got is tutorial how to write integration tests for REST API with Node.js. Um, it's a really big one. Like, uh, I don't know, it's like three times bigger than the one about the optimization, basically. <laughs> is really long and uh, it walks you from creating the app itself, basically minimal backend for to do lists, right? Um, I mean, it's minimal, but it still like uses Mongo and quite a lot of things basically and uh, going to the okay, so now we created it. So now we created testing setup and write the first test. And then uh, actually doing the exactly same thing, but in a test driven manner. So if you are, if you want to learn the test driven approach and different between the writing tests after and test driven approach, then this article would probably give you a very good understanding of that, at least by example, right? So it is very big, but if you want to get into integration tests, uh, specifically in this case with Express JS and what did they use for testing? I forgot. Let me try to find it. So um, da -da -da, our integration tests. So we are view part one on GitHub. Um, come on, where is your test library? This is MongoDB. This is okay. They use Axios for requests. Come on, where's the test runner? 
Mocha. Okay, so they use Mocha for test running and uh, which is, you know, one of the, I think it's the most popular library testing runner for now at least. Uh, so yes, yeah, so if you're interested in seeing a uh, very detailed and step-by-step -step walkthrough for the integration testing Express apps with Mocha, then, well, this is a pretty good uh, guide with everything you need to know about that, basically. All right, next article we got is Pro Tips for Visual Studio Code to be Productive in 2018. There are some pro tips here that I didn't even know about. This is why I decided to highlight it because it's not like one of those that you know have very basic things that you can find in a documentation. So first tip being Git and Git Lens. Uh, turns out there's this Git Lens extension for VS Code that is absolutely amazing. Um, not just not, like it has so many features. It shows you inline uh, comments for every like from every comment basically whatever this line came from it shows you can quickly navigate and watch the git history and compare the files and do the blame and all that kind of stuff seems to be crazy i need to install that um, live share is probably something um, everyone knows already if not then well um, vs code has a live share extension that allows you to collaborate and share your workspace in real time with anyone you want uh, works really well by the way uh, one of the Complaints that I heard is basically, hey, I have to ha use Skype or Discord or whatever to actually talk to a person. Can we have that inside of extension? That would be kind of great, but you know, it's not a major problem. Um, this is something I didn't know about. So you can actually convert JSON structure to code uh, or rather the type definition. For example, in this case, they demonstrate the class definition in C Sharp or type definition in TypeScript. And this is just insane. It's like, you can like this is seems to be the part of vs code features themselves which is kind of crazy right yeah rename all occurrences is something that i'm using all the time you can hit f2 to do that so this will basically change the instance um, throughout the entire project and if you want to change it within file yeah there's a command or control f2 shortcuts um, go to definition is probably something everyone knows you can edit multiple lines as probably also so everyone knows debugger is common uh, key bindings and command palette is also common and that's basically it but yeah you know if you didn't know about that do have a look there are some really cool uh, tips here as well for the basic features too all right continuing we got creating a chrome extension in 2018 the good the bad and the meh so this is a retrospective from the author of um, extension Puppeteer Recorder, which we'll talk about in the libraries and demos section. And he basically talks about his journey on writing that extension, uh, how exactly does the modern Chrome extension works, what's the architecture, how does the Chrome global work, how do you manage states, how do you manage messaging, how do you do coding? How do you do debugging? How do you build it? How do you test it? And basically everything that you want to know about building Chrome extensions, right? So if you are interested in seeing someone else's experience and seeing what were their gripes and uh, what kind of problems did they had, then well, check this article out. It talks about, um, well, basically about everything you need to know about writing Chrome extension, at least from, you know, the retrospective uh, of this specific uh, puppeteer recorder extension. All right, next article we got is handling authentication in Vue using Vuex. Uh, just as you imagine, this is a tutorial talking about creating an authentication flow uh, in the client site in Vue app using Vuex store and Vue rotor, I believe. Uh, yes, they do use Vue rotor here. So if you are working with you or you are just getting started and you want to know how exactly to handle the authentication, I think this is one of the options, basically. I am not sure why, like there's some weirdness in the code here and there. Like for example, they use Axios, which is already a promise based uh, request library, but they wrap it in additional promise, which just feels weird. Why not just make it a sync function? But you know, whatever. This is like minor nitpicks. Um, other than that, I think the article is more or less solid. So if you are looking for view authentication starting tutorial, then well, this one is for you. All right, next one we got is an overview of buffers in Node.js. Essentially an introduction, a very basic one for buffers in Node.js. Uh, you, uh, like buffers are pretty powerful abstraction, allows you to do a bunch of things. Uh, and this, 
tutorial just shows you how exactly you can use them, how you can convert things to and from buffers, what exactly you can do them, how you can store them in MongoDB, for example. Although, you know, normally you would not like in this case also stores the strings. And I would say that it's it actually makes more sense to store them in the string. But uh, since it's just an example, this is a kind of artificial thing, right? So it's whatever, whatever works. Uh, but yeah, buffers are pretty cool thing uh, in a very specific cases, but it's uh, good to know about them nonetheless. All right, continuing we got the uh, let's try again. We got the generic sensor API article that uh, talks about the new sensor APIs we are getting uh, with official specs and everything. And some of them I think already shipped in Chrome at least. Um, I think there was a link to can I use there we go. So yeah, so we got um, accelerometer, ambient light sensor, magnetometer, gyroscope, orientation sensor, geolocation sensor and proximity sensor. And uh, currently you can use orientation sensor in Chrome and you can use, I think, accelerometer in Chrome as well. And everything else basically doesn't work because, well, they are, I, I don't think the specs are, oh, no, you can actually use gyro in Chrome as well. And magnetometer is already in Chrome. Okay, that is, that is quite impressive, but only in Chrome, by the way, which is kind of um, silly, I guess. But no, this is not what I want. Uh, this is really different things. Okay, but yeah, um, so, the article talks about which APIs are available and what browsers you can actually use them. Some are behind the Chrome flags, uh, hidden, some magnetometer is, for example, behind the flag and ambient light sensor is also behind the flag in Chrome, which is nice. And uh, yeah, it talks about how exactly you create the, you use the sensors API and how exactly you access the um, data from them and what can you actually do with that data, which I guess more or less up to you, which, you know, um, once again, uh, in my opinion, it's great that we're getting actually standardized API that allow uh, will allow us access to the uh, device sensors, not not necessarily mobile device, right? And uh, the cool thing is that once again, this will bring us to the world where we don't really need native apps. I mean, we still kind of need them, but web is advancing so quick that um, I don't know, five more years maybe, and we won't need app stores. Um, at least that's my hopes, but we'll let's see how that develops. But yeah, if you are interested in working with the sensors uh, using JavaScript on the web, then this article gives you a pretty good starting point. Right, next thing we got is a pull request that was merged into Node.js that implements recursive uh, make dear minus p functionality in uh, Node.js make dear. So uh, yeah, the reasoning was super simple. Um, the author was like, hey, there's the um, make GRP package that is downloaded 8 million times a day, which is just insane when you think about it for one package. And uh, the author was like, yeah, you know what? I'll just added the parent flag to the make dear uh, file system uh, function that if you set it to through it will work as make dear minus P. So we'll create all the folders uh, so that the whole structure exists, which is really simple. And uh, been merged, so probably on the next release, we will get that function shipped and uh, you can finally get rid of that make, um, make dear p package and uh, free up some space, which, which is really nice. Right, next thing we got is a really exciting uh, what we g uh, HTML proposal, which is still ongoing, there's nothing set in stone, but there's a proposal to add lazy load equals on flag to web platform, which basically will defer loading elements like iframe images or whatever until the user scrolls it into view. So basically what currently is implemented using JavaScript typically, right? So until you like scroll down, you won't see it. Uh, you will be able to just say, hey, lazy load on, and this will uh, defer the loading until the user scroll in. Uh, which I think is really awesome. And I um, cannot really wait to see that in the platform, but apparently there are some problems because um, some versions of, I think uh, IE and Edge have lazy load equals one, which does something completely different. So yeah, that platform is a bit of a mess as usual, but uh, we're gonna see how that ends up. Okay, next thing we got is a bit of a crazy thing. Uh, so just to show you how popular WebAssembly is, it actually has a better cross-browser support than web components that's been out for 
hell if I know how long it's been like web components has been around for like five years at least I think like the polymer one of the first versions of polymer was released in 2012 or 13 or something there's been like ages and yeah custom elements are still not even not even in Firefox they're still behind the flag there that is crazy when you think about it but <laughs> WebAssembly is basically supported just about everywhere right now which is kind of awesome I'll, I'll take that you know what all right, and um, next thing we got is uh, WebAssembly is here for Unity 3D. So if you're not familiar with Unity, it is a um, gaming engine, or I guess 3D engine, not just gaming, that allows you to build, well, among other things, and I think primarily it is used for video games, but you also can build any 3D worlds or VR experiences or whatever. And um, one of the cool things of Unity is that you can compile the Unity projects to a bunch of platforms, including, you know, Windows, Linux, consoles, phones, whatever you can imagine. There's like two billion of different platforms. And prior to that, they had the SMJS as a compilation target, and they had some really cool demos together with Firefox um, that worked really well and was very impressive. And now they finally shipped compilation to WebAssembly. So instead of uh, ASMJS, you can now ship to WebAssembly, which will work in all browsers. It will work like with WebGL and everything. And uh, apparently it's way more efficient than ASMJS, which is kind of great. Uh, so I can't wait to see if there's gonna be any web-based games that are made in Unity, which, you know, considering how the ASM will or WebAssembly will develop, you're gonna see uh, additional stuff like garbage collection simmed and all that kind of things. So I think the gaming in the browser has a pretty bright future. So we're gonna see how that develops. Okay, next thing we got is uh, the article from Project Zero. Uh, this is the Google's project. If you don't know the security project that basically searches and reports vulnerabilities. The article is called The Problems and Promise of WebAssembly and talks about the bugs that was found in WebAssembly engines uh, up until now, essentially. I won't talk about all of them, so if you're interested in the security issues, do have a read yourself, but uh, I will just quote uh, one line, basically. Overall, the majority of bugs we found in WebAssembly were related to parsing of WebAssembly binaries, and this has been mirrored in vulnerabilities reported by other parties. So the um, core problems of WebAssembly right now is just parsing the binaries, right? So just the parser. The um, environment itself has not had any bugs whatsoever, it seems so far, at least not the bugs, the vulnerabilities, right? They are predicting that two emerging features of WebAssembly uh, that will likely have a huge security impact would be threading, which, you know, threading is always pain in ass, and garbage collection, because both of those features are very complex and very hard to pull off correctly. And um, at, at first will probably lead to some security problems, but, you know, um, I still think that's gonna be worth it. And we're gonna see how uh, problematic it's gonna be, because I mean, Come on, let's that's, that's, that's just be honest. All the browser vendors did incredible job on WebAssembly front, considering there was no vulnerabilities within the environment itself, just the loaders and parsers, right? Which is like crazy when you think about it. Okay, and the last thing I got in, no, not the last thing. This is uh, one before the last article. Um, this is actually the video from uh, Kyle Simpson from the JS Camp Barcelona. It's called Keep Betting on JavaScript and essentially it outlines the history of JavaScript from the very early days, from like 90s, up till now and with a sort of outlook into the future and why you should keep betting on JavaScript and why it's gonna only get better, which is really cool. So if you uh, never worked with JavaScript in 90s or you know even before maybe until last year or something, highly recommended looking into all of that and uh, and there are some really cool, interesting things here. So, so yeah, just just watch it. It's not that long. It's like 40 minutes and really entertaining. Right. And the last thing I got is the article on Dev2 called What are common myths about software careers? So it's not really an article. It's just a question, right? But there is a pretty large discussion here, which I found to be quite interesting. There are some very... Um, 
very uncommon things in the comments let's put it this way so if you are you know if you are thinking about doing cs career or if you are already doing it or if you're just starting out and you want to know what kind of things you should expect then do have a look at this discussion there are some pretty cool things in there and uh yes my favorite one is probably mathematics yes the myth about mathematics is insane like everyone thinks you have to know mathematics to be a software developer while this is true for some fields and like 90 percent of software development doesn't really care much about mathematics it's like yeah i guess you know okay but yeah is basically very interesting and uh, recommended read. Um, all right, now we are uh, at the releases section and the first major release of this week is VS Code uh, version 1.26, the July release, which brings in a really cool feature called breadcrumbs. So you now have those breadcrumbs uh, that show the, not just the path. So in addition to the path of the file, you will actually see the breadcrumbs of the functions, classes, and whatnot, whatever um, your code actually co um, contains. And the cool thing is that you can use control shift or command shift uh, semicolon to jump into it and then navigate using them, which you can see right now on the screen. This simplifies navigation so much. It is just incredibly cool. And like you can, start so after you open the breadcrumb of the current code you can start typing the name of the function and it will actually filter the list by that name and you you know after you hit enter it you will jump to it which is so fast it is insane just loving it so far and obviously there's like fixes additional changes and you know if you're interested do have a look this code keeps being one of my favorite um um, editors i think the only one i'm using in the latest time so yeah they they even added the rapid render which improves the startup speeds is you know something that a lot of people have been complaining about but i'm running it off ssd so i don't really notice that much yeah do have a look at the release note if you're interested in additional details but uh, yes it is quite awesome right next thing we got is npm 640 with um and basically uh, three new highlights. So first one being search for authentication token defined by environment variables. And uh, it stopped filtering out non IPv4 addresses from local addresses, making NPM actually use IPv6 when, when it must, which was a problem, I think. I'm not sure that's a, should be considered a feature, not a bug fix, but uh, yeah. And you can also configure audit level for non-zero exit, uh, from npm audit so this was a request uh, by a lot of people for the ci so basically you can now say uh, audit level high and um, it will basically exit with zero only for high level vulnerabilities right so which is quite quite nice but yeah you know just a minor release with some additional features Right, next thing we got is uh, Node.js August security releases. There's a bunch of minor releases for all the current or LTS versions of Node that patch some CVE vulnerabilities. There's a list of CVEs here with the patches applied. So you can have a look and you know, if you're interested, nothing um, other than that is shipped, I believe. So it's primarily security patches. So uh, be sure to update if you're using them in production because those are kind of important. Right, and I think this is the last thing we got is Puppeteer version 1.7 with the Chromium 70 and uh, page type now supports typing emoji, <laughs> which is a very important feature you have to have. And um, the um, uh, from now on, they're also gonna be publishing Puppeteer core package that doesn't download Chromium at install time. So if you have Chromium already pre-installed, you can just have Puppeteer Core and uh, use it without any additional uh, Chromium installation, right? Because you don't always want to do that, uh, actually, especially like in the Docker environments, for example, when you have um, Chromium running in a separate container, typically. But yeah, it's uh, really neat to see Puppeteer developing even more. Right, and now we come to the libraries, demos, and all that kind of stuff section. The first thing we got for today is actually a book release, a um, new book by uh, Dr. Axel Rauschmeier, JavaScript for Impatient Programmers. So uh, if you've never heard about Dr. Rauschmeier, he is really good. He writes exceptional books about JavaScript, and uh, 
basically if you're just getting started from with javascript or you want to know it more in depth then i guess this book is for you so there is a preview of the book available over the half of the book you can just look it online or download the pdf or epub or mobi and just check it out and to see if you like it there's also a table of contents for the complete book it seems to include just about everything you might want about javascript uh, basics or like you know the core of the language not basics is the wrong word in this case because it's very in-depth um, including the modern stuff like async awaits and you know um, whatever you can imagine basically it seems to be quite good and it's just 29 us dollars which is very cheap so yeah um do have a look if you are looking for a good javascript book um, for whatever reason books never worked out that well for me so i didn't really i haven't actually read that many and bought that many uh, at least with relation to you know specific programming languages so like the concept books like the clean uh, what was the clean code, I think, and stuff like this, I found interesting. The books with code just never worked for me. I don't know why, but yeah. Okay, uh, next thing I want to highlight is the ByteConf React, which is, I think, just a really cool idea. So the guys decided to do a small streamed online on Twitch free conference uh, about React. And it's going to happen on Friday, August 31st. You can just watch it for free on Twitch and it's kind of great. There's um, some pretty cool speakers over here, including Mr. Kenzie Dots, Tracy Lee and uh, um, Kyle Shevlin and yeah, Tim Roberts, whatever. Basically, I think most of those guys are really famous. And uh, if you don't know them, you probably should look them up because they do some really cool things. And uh, <clears throat> they also have schedule here and it's going to be quite interesting it seems so i'm really looking forward to that and really looking forward to checking it out and i hope if even if i won't have time to watch all of them i hope they will publish it either on twitch itself or on youtube afterwards so you can actually re-watch that because that, that sounds really cool like a really cool idea by the way right next thing we got is run electron from mr sindrosaurus um command that runs electron uh, and trims all the junk terminal output that it does which is really annoying. Uh, if you ever used Electron, you know you will get like tons of those messages, warning, textured window, failed to load, Chrome DevTools, blah, 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 uncaught and promise, could not instantiate. And you know, there's like a bunch of errors that are not your app specific, that are uh, Electron specific, and you will still see them and there's no way to disable them. So he wrote a package that just removes that basically from the output and you only see the app login, which is really nice. So if you're working with Electron, do have a look at this. Maybe you will find it useful. All right, next thing we got is Rusty.js, a minimalistic JavaScript model view framework for building user interfaces. Seems to be very minimalistic and uh, quite simple. And you know, there's like emitter model view. Um, that's basically all it has. Class-based ES6. Um, so if you're looking for a framework like this, do check it out. It is version 0 0.6, so take it with a grain of salt. That means API could change, everything can break, so be careful about using that in production. Next thing we got is nightly.js, zero dependency JavaScript library that enables night mode in your website easily. So essentially one button toggle for nightly mode for your websites. Um, not sure how well it would work with uh, CSS, um, CSS frameworks, because you know it seems to change the styles for just about everything. But uh, I, th I do like the idea of like one, um, one button change of theme for the website that you can just plug and play. But I think it's gonna be a lot of work to make it work nicely with um, frameworks, CSS frameworks, because you know, they, they kind of have their own styles. But um, yeah, just give it a shot if you're looking for something like this, it seems to be quite nice. Next thing we got is React Async Elements, uh, suspend friendly async React Elements for common situations. Uh, so the React Suspense has been shipped in the React 16, right? Now we have a bunch of um, um, cool approaches to handling async work. And this basically gives you a common elements that you could use um, that are suspend friendly, like image, script, video, audio, iframe, embed, style sheet. And uh, yeah, it's very basic, but does the job and yeah, seems to be quite nice. Basically, you know, if you're looking for something like this do check it out. Okay, next thing we got is space time, a lightweight JavaScript time zone library because date and time working in JavaScript is pain in ass and um, we, 
we definitely need more nicer libraries that work with time and make it easier to work with it. So this one has moment like API, 45 kilobytes of uh, weight, no uh, dependencies, uh, and it does include internalization API because of that. But you know, that's that's I think that's fine. So it has a lot of really cool methods uh, in addition to what the moment.js provides, like for example, you can uh, create a new space time object and then you can go to a different time zone, which is really convenient. Or you can check if the specific space time uh, people are asleep or if you have, there was some like, yeah, really um, additional progress. Yeah, you can get progress uh, by month, day, hour or so on and so forth, which is like, yeah, some really neat methods here. So if you're looking for a bit more advanced uh, library to work with dates, then have a look at this one. It is pretty nice. Okay, next thing we got is ScribbleTune node module to intuitively create uh, music with JavaScript and export it as MIDI files. Um, I don't, like I've seen something like this already, but there's so many of them, which doesn't make it worse, but you know, it's kind of great. Uh, so basically you can just uh, scribble things using notes, literally, you know, you provide like C4. Uh, and um, the cool thing is that it has like additional helper methods, like repeat seven times, you can create patterns and you can build scales and there's like additional modification flags and chords and whatever you can imagine. And you can just then export it to the MIDI which is also quite nice. So I, I'm not sure why would I personally probably won't use that, but I'm, you know, I'm not exactly the audio guy. So I rarely work with a web audio or anything like this, but you know, if you're working with MIDI or if you're working with procedurally generating music, then this probably is a library for you. Okay. Next thing we got is node rate. Uh, bleh, let's try that again. Node rate limiter flexible. Uh, rate limiter for Node.js that uh, basically can uh, works as a proxy, right? And can rate limit things like Redis, Mongo, MySQL, Postgres requests. So it seems to be like specialized on those, uh, like pre-built to specially handle those cases, which I mean, it's nice, but I don't know why would you want to do that? It's like, I, I think maybe for the very basic rate limiting case, it, it could work, but I would think that, you know, using hub proxy or proper rate limiter or not even exposing your MongoDB MySQL or Postgres would be a better solution, but maybe that's just me. Maybe you have a very specific case for it that I just can't think about. Uh, hey, Joiner Jack, thank you for your cheer. This is really awesome. This is my first cheer ever. So this is quite exciting. <laughs> All right, let us continue. Uh, we got Nano ID, which is a tiny 145 bytes, uh, secure URL friendly, unique string ID generator for JavaScript. It is, um, seems to be quite cool. So basically if you are, uh, have a case where you have to generate very small, unique IDs, then this package is, seems to be quite nice. So it's, it's very tiny as I already said, 145 bytes and it uses cryptography API to generate those. So it's going to be quite unique and they are also quite compact from 36 to 21 symbol long. Um, I typically use the, they have it in comparison here, UUID v4, which is also quite nice and seems to be just slightly slower than Nano ID, but I mean, it is UUID. So it is, um, where is it? I think this is the one. Uh, so UUID is like typically they are quite, no, this is not the one, UUID v4 NPM. Uh, I, yeah, I think this is the one, right? So uh, if you never used UUID or, you know, never heard about it, they are typically quite long. So you have this kind of uh, very long five, four segment string that is uh, V4 is time-based, if I remember correctly. Uh, no, V1 is time space, V4 is random. Okay, this is, um, so I typically used V1, uh, which was uh, timestamp based to erase the collisions. Um, but you know, if you're looking for something lighter, faster and simpler, then I guess nano ID, uh, should be working for you. So check it out. Okay. Uh, next thing we got is tone JS, a web audio framework for making interactive music in the browser. So 
It looks very similar to the um, previous library that we looked in the Node.js, but this time around it built on a web audio API and works in the browser and allows you to essentially do the music in the browser. So you can, uh, there's like some pretty advanced things with attack and release changes and scheduling and loops and instruments and seems to be very advanced actually. So if you wanna do music in the browser and if you don't wanna do it on a very low level by using a web audio API, then well, this seems to be pretty cool library. It have even like digital signal processing uh, to build your own synthesizer effects and complex control signals, which sounds insane. So yeah, it seems, seems really cool. All right, next thing we got is flowchart.js, a tiny library that allows you to generate flowcharts from uh, text. So on the screen, you can see a very simple text uh, output, which basically binds nodes to the uh, text, right? And then you can use those nodes to construct a flowchart. Uh, seems to be really straightforward. Probably could be really cool to apply that in the MDX to have marked down with the flowcharts that are dynamically generated. That actually sounds like a fun project. I also feel like something is blocked part of the JavaScript here. There we go, now we can see the download buttons. <laughs> um yeah and uh it seems to be pretty cool so operation my operation test you have like types and yeah basically whatever you can imagine you would need in flowchart it's all here and uh seems to be working quite nicely so yeah pretty cool and you can style it yeah there's some colorful flowcharts looks nice all right, uh, next thing we got is the Puppeteer Recorder extension, which we talked in the article section. So the retrospective was from the author of that extension. The extension itself is really awesome. This is something I found to be pretty cool. And I think one of the, again, coolest highlights of this week. So um, the extension allows you to record any interactions you do with a browser and export them as the script for the puppeteer, which you can then just load within Node.js and execute it, which is just kind of great when you think about it. It is like you no longer have to write your own puppeteer scripts, you can just record them, which is awesome. I um, so there's the there's the website from them. I, it doesn't seem to be open source, but you know, it seems to be usable for free, I guess, as part of their product, which is fair, but it's still this, the whole idea of the extension and making it easier to make puppeteer scripts and make automation as simple as just clicking in your browser is just really great. This is like, yeah, check it out if you, you wanna try it yourself. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be, it doesn't seem to be open source, but you know, whatever, still, still really cool. Right, next thing we got is um, image to image translation right in a browser using the edge to cats network. So this, I think, I don't remember, I don't think I've ever shown this off on the podcast, but this basically a neural network trains to draw cats based on your outline, right? So you draw outline and the neural network tries to predict how the cat like this would look, which 90% of the time looks hilarious and absolutely bonkers, but still very fun to play around with. Um, so before that, the uh, whole thing was built in Python as it typically happens. I think it was Python and uh, you could use it. We would do a request to the server with your outline and then generate the image in the server and then show it to you, right? So someone ported that into the browsers. You can actually do that in the browsers. We can try to draw, um, I probably model loaded. Where's my drawing? Yes, no, there we go, Ooh, clear, there we go. Okay, so as you might imagine, it blocks the thread quite a bit because it does happen in the browser. You can actually draw a cat here. Uh, it's gonna be a very terrible cat, there you go. <laughs> that looks that looks terrible. That's probably gonna, <laughs> that's, that's gonna go terribly bad. There you go, there's my cat, and it's gonna have a tail. That is very broken. What is, I guess this is the thickness, yeah, okay. So yeah, you can produce some terribly looking things in this in this API. It is, but you know, still this happens in the browser. This is just like right here. My browser is gener generating these images using a neural network, using TensorFlow.js as usual, which is kind of great. And uh, you have the same demos for uh, facades, shoes, and faces. You can actually draw houses here with um, blocks. 
design your own terrible uh house or terrible shoe there you go um yeah so you know play around with it it's really cool it's another uh, great example of using tensorflow in the browser the source is on the github if you're interested check it out it is very impressive um all right next thing we got is uh, mac os version 6 um, i thought i'd just highlight that because i don't know how many people know about this but archive.org has a software section where they archive very old software that is no longer copyrighted licensed, or whatever and is basically a public domain now and uh, you can test it and use it right on the website so in this case they uh, published macOS uh, system 6 which is super old from 1988 and you can literally run it in the browser i hope nothing is blocked here yeah so you can download the whole thing and it will run the emulator right in the browser. I don't think it's uh, WebAssembly yet, but it is JavaScript and uh, the whole thing just, you know, there you go. Welcome to Macintosh. You, you have the whole thing here. You can drag around the things. You can, um, you can open things. You can page set up. You can get info. There you go. It is kind of insane when you think about it and um, it, it works and you can play around with the really old soft, not just Mac OS 6, just to, um, just to uh, give you an impression, there's the software library collection, which includes some very old MS-DOS games, for example, which is really great. So if you, you know, if you ever played old Prince of Persia or Prehistoric 2 or whatever, like I think Prehistoric 2, does it still has this, this was one of the games when I played when I was like a kid. We had this like super old uh, 386 um, PC that was terribly slow, but you know, was still fun to mingle around with it. And uh, yeah, you, you get this prehistoric launch screen. My game is still working in 2018, programmed in 1992 at 200, um, 286 at 12 megahertz. Yeah. So. You know, if you like, if you never played any of those, if you never even heard about them, if you never knew Archive.org provides service like this, do check it out. There's some really cool things over here. And it's not just games, there's also software. You can even use ZX Spectrum right here. There's like incredible amounts of really cool software from old times here. So just check it out. All right, last uh, thing I wanna highlight in the demo section is MK Cert Tool. Uh, which is uh, not strictly JavaScript, but I just think it's really awesome because <clears throat> it's a simple zero config tool that allows you make locally trusted development certificates with any names you'd like. So basically, um, the you know since we have a e very easy way to deploy HTTPS websites to the public endpoints right now because we have Let's Encrypt, you can just say, hey, give me a HTTPS certificate and you have it free. And you, um, a lot of people started saying that, hey, you should test locally with HTTPS too, because browsers handle HTTP and HTTPS requests very differently, right? So if you have mixed content, for example, it might break things. So you want to have proper path, you want to test it with HTTPS and testing in production is yeah, not, not a very good approach, right? Let's just put it this way. So this MKCR tool, allows you to generate the um, HTTPS certificates or, you know, just the development certificates for a local host very easily. And they're going to be trusted. They're going to be for any domain and you literally just run one command and it works in Windows, Linux, Mac OS, whatever the hell you can imagine. It is very easy to use and uh, written in Golang. So, you know, you just literally can run it anywhere. Um, yeah, so if you're working on HTTPS websites, check it out. It is very cool, very, I forgot to start it. I should fix that right now. Um, yeah, MS-DOS theme park. Yes, there is a theme park. Yeah, I mean, there is, as I said, there is so many cool things out there on archive. Just check them out. It is absolutely incredible. All right, before we wrap it up, I have some uh, incredible bonkers for you. So the first one being um, most horrible, <laughs> If you had to name the most horrible part of this code, what would it be? And there's a screenshot from the programming horror subreddit that presents an authentication that literally calls SQL API using select all from users and then does the JavaScript filtering of accounts comparing username and password in plain text in the browser, in JavaScript. 
And um, yeah, so, and this is apparently a tool, internal tool, internet application, which is already better than, you know, making it public, that powers uh, 1,500 users, which means that this is a really large enterprise company and they have a software like this running in the background, which is on one hand, very funny, on the other hand, terrifying. Uh, but yeah, just, just look at this code when you have time. It is it's painful to look at. Uh, especially cool is this if true equals true return false because you know sometimes it might not be true <laughs> no yeah there's <laughs> just you know the longer you keep looking at this code the worse it becomes there's so many terrible things in here, but you know i'll just leave it to you guys want to see something nasty that depends that highly depends on what you mean by that <laughs> all right um you can send me your nasty thing. I will, uh, I will peek at it at least. Uh, meanwhile, let's have a look at the, this amazing um, thread on Twitter. Uh, it's a code, send it over. I always uh, want to see a nasty code that is always interesting to try to figure out how people thought when writing that. Okay, so the next daily thing I want to highlight, it's not exactly programming related, but it is uh, sort of a peek, sneak peek into the scientific community. Uh, this is a thread uh, that starts like this. Who wants to hear scientific intrigue? A few weeks ago, a group of physical chemists posted a paper online announcing the observation of superconductivity at room temperature. Today, I posted a comment pointing out something funny in their data. So, um, if you're interested in how this science works and how some things might go south and especially in physics and chemistry and all those kind of you know very um how do you call them it's not precise uh scientific fields but oh man i don't know the english term for that actually is it precise scientific term? but basically yes if you're if you're just interested in looking in having like you know small insight and a very crazy intrigue in a scientific area of superconductivity there's a pretty large thread of 43 tweets, I think, which is still ongoing, by the way, so it's not resolved by any mean. Just read it. It is incredibly cool, like highly recommend it. Um, okay, don't vomit. Okay, um, this link is highlighted as visited, so I kind of assume I already saw that at some point. Um, this, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, this is an old one. This is the Java code. Uh, this is basically, I, I think it was posted somewhere with how to write Java code without um, parents. And all the parents are just uh, aligned on the very right side of the code, which looks kind of like broken Python, but <laughs> with all the parents on the right side. Yeah, it is very terrible and very painful to look at. I <laughs> totally agree. This is just bad. All right, and uh, yeah. Python programmer trying Java, but it's not JavaScript, is it? It's Java. This is not JavaScript. JavaScript doesn't have private static. This is definitely Java. This is Java. So labeling is wrong, but uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, this is still the hilarious one, yeah. All right, and before we wrap this up, I have the last uh, funny thing for you. This is sort of a um, very hilarious tweet that from uh, Mr. Darren Miller that I just thought I would highlight because I found it to be absolutely um, I, I think this is how I shall call myself from now on. Um, so the tweet goes like this. I just figured out how to remove stigma of remote workers. I now describe myself as cloud native employee. So this is what I shall call myself from now on. I'm going to be cloud native employee. And you know, because I am so good with the cloud, I live in the cloud. <laughs> this is all I ever wanted to say about myself. I, uh, you know what, I should add this into my, um, oh, no, that's wrong. I should add this into my Twitter biography. I think I'm just going to be cloud native employee. This sounds great. <laughs> okay. This is basically all I have for today's podcast. Um, all the news that I wanted to cover. If you guys in chat, if you guys watching right now have anything that you think I missed or you want to share something of your own or... Um, I don't know, you have something else you want to ask me or discuss, throw it in the chat right now. If not, then we can just wrap it up here. I'm going to give you um, a couple of minutes to do that. And uh, well, if there's nothing, then we can just wrap it up here and go have our awesome weekend and do a family meeting, friends meeting, whatever. 
Airbnb or standard? I hate standard. Um, um, definitely Airbnb. I hate standard, first of all, because no semicolons. Second of all, because you cannot just call something standard. Like this is the, it's like, you can't just say that your thing is standard when it's not even a standard, you know? This is not how it works. Plus, yes, just pick one of them, it doesn't really matter. For me, definitely Airbnb, but also heavily modified one because I don't really like all of the Airbnb things. Um, on one hand, it is, yes, I know semicolons, it's nice to write without them. The problem is there is the ASI, which is the automatic semicolon insertion, and the problem is it's not very consistent. So I've seen people break their code thinking they can omit semicolons there so many times. You know what? I'll just stick to my prettier inserting semicolons automatically just to be sure it's going to work. Like I know it's not very common. I know there are like very obscure edge cases, but I've seen them so many times that, you know what? I'm just going to stick with them. <laughs> but I totally understand if you don't want to use them and... Uh, if you can uh, be sure that it's gonna work for you. Like if, if you're okay with that, I'm totally fine. Like if, if I'm contributing to a project that uses standard and they have uh, prettier rules and everything set up, I'm fine with that. Like I don't really mind writing in a specific style, you know. I have never heard anyone go with vanilla Airbnb. Yep, yep, very much the same. <laughs> two or four spaces, two spaces. I don't like my space wasted. Are we gonna have tabs versus spaces holy war here now? <laughs> I mean, one of them. Also, yeah, I mean, again, I don't really care much as long as it's consistent. That is absolutely the good point. So as long as you pick one formatting style and stick with it, like I still have one of my old projects that use four spaces. And I think I still have one of the older projects that use tabs instead of spaces when I, back when I was using, uh, you know, like this stuff, because I'm just too lazy to reformat them. I don't see any reason. Harder one, flow or TypeScript, none of them. I, even though I don't understand benefits of typing, I prefer working without that because, uh, I, you know, it's kind of slows me down most of the time. And I, um, unless I'm working with people who I know are very junior, and who I know are gonna screw up because of the typing errors, I would not enforce any of that. But if we're gonna start a project and it's gonna be like junior developers who are gonna have problems with typings and who are gonna introduce bugs because of types, I would pick TypeScript. VS Code or Sublime? Um, I use both actually on macOS. So I have Sublime license purchased for quite a long time and it was uh, types are, well, I mean, it's not types are for juniors. Come on, it's not like this, but it's easier for juniors to screw up things if they are not type checked, right? This is what I want to say because most of the senior developers kind of know how the, how the types works and they are less prone to making those screw ups. Although, you know, I, I'm not saying I never did that. I did that as well. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> inserting objects where they don't belong, object, object to string. Yep. Yep. Those are the things. Uh, okay, coming back to VS Code or Sublime. I do have a Sublime. I have a license for it. I've used it extensively before VS Code become, uh, became my primary uh, editor. And I think now I use VS Code for like 90% or maybe 95 at this point. And I use Sublime for either very large files that are like, you know, hundreds of megabytes JSON or whatever. Or I use Sublime for when I need some very quick editors. Uh, Northern Fira code is my setup for VS code. I don't, I know Fira code is, uh, this ligatures font, right? This is something that I know fire code is not what I want. Well, wait, I misspelled it. I was like, that is not, yeah, Fira code. Yeah. So I don't really like ligatures. I don't really use it. I use the default font. I don't know what is Nord though. Nord VS code. What is Nord? Nord is, oh, this is a theme. Okay. Oh, that looks not bad. Yeah, I, I prefer the material theme. So I, I have this, um, where's my VS code? Let me just plop it over here. So this is my uh, weekly preparation. As you can see here, this is what I use. It's very bland setup. Let me open one of the recent, uh, we have this that Black Friday example. Um, this, is, this is basically what I prefer. This is my preferred theme, preferred setup. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's okay, you know, it works. I'm old 4k, the thing, I mean, I'm, 
as you can see here, I'm wearing glasses. Those are pretty thick as well. So I just usually, you know, do this and go like, eh, but what did they change it? Go like this. There you go. You can now see everything. Also, when I'm streaming, I typically zoom in quite a lot because people typically complain that everything is too small. <laughs> so yeah, zoom is a godsend feature in all the editors and it is always painful to see software that doesn't let you zoom at your will uh, because yeah, you know, like I have, I don't have 4K monitor, I have 1440, but even that is, sometimes things are too tiny for me. Yeah. Okay, guys, any other questions, things you want to discuss or, um, yeah. If not, then we can just uh, wrap it up here and go do our Saturday things. I think away. I think a waiter promises. What is this question? They are the same. It's like you cannot use a sink await with the, without the promises. Exactly. <laughs> like, come on, the sink await is just a syntactic sugar for promises. And uh, of course, I'm going to use a sink await, not just promises. Like, I actually combine them mostly because you can use catch to do this um, neat thing with um, um, error handling, right? It is a syntactic sugar, right? Because you can just use, you can just return promise and use it as is. Oh, what do I want to run? Let's say glitch. Let's do some coding. All right. Uh, maybe I can just, nah, I'm too lazy. Let's just use uh, new project. Hello Express. Prototypes or classes. <laughs> come on, guy. Oh, come on. Stop, stop screwing with me. No, I'm not going to answer that. So, um, you know what? No, I'm not gonna, let me just start uh, VS code and I'm gonna show you what I mean. So, um, first of all, JavaScript. So basically what you can do is you can say return new promise, uh, or I guess, um, let's just say our function run is new promise resolve. We set timeout, we resolve after one second, right? So let's, uh, one second, we just say sleep, let's call it sleep, right? So you have two ways of doing it. You can either say await sleep, and then you wait for whatever, okay, for one second, or you can do sleep then, and then you do your stuff, right? So this is effectively exactly the same. So this is why I'm saying that uh, then your code goes here, right? So this is effectively the same. This is why I'm saying, uh, this is the syntactic sugar um, function or arrow function depends on the context arrow functions are there for a reason most of the time I use arrow functions but if you don't need to bind the this to the current object then um, I mean function might be also working uh, the way I like to use combine a weight with promises is that I typically go like this error results and you just do promise function, right? And then you do then you get result and you return result, or you catch and you go error and you return error, right? So if you do this, you can actually it is very, um, how you put it, it is very golang like, I guess, because you get both error and result in this case, but in this case, you don't have to wrap around with try catch this or that you don't need that anymore you have arrow functions now what why you would need that <laughs> like come on what are those questions are you from the last century <laughs> okay um yeah but you get the idea right any more silly questions or non-silly questions uh do you just want to sit here and discuss ye all the javascript Nope. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let me see. Um, let me open my Streamlabs remote control, which is extremely convenient and I don't have to click things on the screen, which is always nice. So guys, thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for all your questions and feedback and stop, stop with this or I'm not going to react to that content. Why are you doing this to me? Okay. Um, yeah, once again, thank you for watching. Thank you for staying with me. Thank you for your support. As always, uh, if you missed the show on Twitch, you can watch it on YouTube, you can watch it on Dev2, you can listen to 
Uh, it's on uh, SoundCloud, whatever. Uh, if you like the show, please support me. There's a link in the description, uh, whatever you like. The show happens weekly, so you are more than welcome to submit your things to it. Thank you for watching. Send your questions to my email or GitHub account or whatever. I will answer them over there. If you have more questions, join our Discord server. I will be more than happy to answer them there. And I will be more than happy to help you with your JavaScript problems as well as the bunch of our guys who are there. We are quite a helpful bunch. Um, yeah, have an awesome rest of the weekend and I see you next week. Bye.